Hello, I'm Father Columbus Stewart, Executive Director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, or as we call it, HIMMEL. HIMMEL is an international organization based out of Minnesota in the United States. Our work is solely funded by donations and grants. Our purpose is to preserve and share the world's handwritten past to inspire a deeper understanding of our present and future. Handwritten books, manuscripts, are clues documenting what humans over thousands of years thought important enough to share. It is incredible what these voices from the past have to tell and teach us. Therefore, we photograph manuscripts around the world so their contents can be available for centuries to come. We place a special priority on manuscripts located in regions endangered by war, political instability, or other threats. Preservation begins through partnerships with local libraries, agreements that allow Himmel to make digital images of the manuscripts in their collections. Digitization is done entirely through local teams to whom we provide equipment, training, technical support, and payment for their work. We photograph everything in a collection because we don't know what might be significant in the future. Copies of the digital images are given to the repository that holds the manuscripts. Another copy comes to Himmel in Minnesota. Himmel employs catalogers and other staff to ensure that the digital images of these manuscripts are identified, supported for long-term access, and are made freely available to the public via our website. One of the many advantages that comes with doing the work that we do is that my team and I meet with extraordinary people from every corner of the world. We learn about their culture, their present experiences, and how they see the future. This series gives me the opportunity to introduce these extraordinary people and their stories to all of you, as well as to ask them questions I never had the chance to ask before. It is my belief and it has been proven again and again throughout history that when we truly listen to what others have to tell us, we build an understanding. And that is always a good foundation for collaboration. And of course, manuscripts and our written human knowledge are always at the heart of these encounters. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this journey to listen. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome to the second episode of season two of To Listen, A Global Journey. My guest today is Jack Tanous, Associate Professor of History and Hellenic Studies at Princeton University and Chair for the Center for the Study of Late Antiquity. And congrats, by the way, on tenure and on uh, being the chair for the center. Jack and I met in Aleppo, Syria in June of 2008, which was a, a visit full of adventures. Would you say that? Yeah, and I learned that Columba has got a much stronger stomach than I do. He, we, we both drink from the same holy well. I had some unholy consequences, <laughs> but Columba didn't. <laughs> uh, I, I think I knew just to take a drop, um, <laughs> but that's, that's where we first met and you know, it was sort of an incredible experience in all sorts of ways. Discovering Jack is a fellow Houstonian, we're both Texans, but it's also a visit in Aleppo that we look back on as if it were a hundred years ago. It was a completely different age back when Syria was the most stable part of the Middle East. And most poignantly, our host, Mor Gregorios, who was the Syriac Orthodox Metropolitan of Aleppo, uh, then in his prime, of course, was kidnapped in April of 2013 and never heard from again. So all of those beautiful things we saw, the people we met, uh, so much of it has changed or, or even gone. So when we talk about the, the story of Christians in the Middle East, as Jack and I will be doing today, we remember their present situation always, even as we lift up their incredible tradition. So I, I wanted Jack particularly to speak to us today about one of his passions, which is the literature, life, history of Arabic speaking Christians. Jack also does Syriac and all sorts of other things, uh, 
we mentioned Hellenic studies, so they've got him over there. But I, I think what he can bring to our program is telling people about a tradition they may not be fully aware of, because in most people's sort of common imagination, Arabic equals Islam or Muslims. And in fact, there are numerous and very diverse communities of Christians in the Middle East who use Arabic, whether Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant. Now, I'll put a little plug in right here to say that one of the reasons I'm interested in Christian Arabic is that we of Hemel have worked with our partners in the region to digitize thousands of Christian Arabic manuscripts from a number of different traditions. And our hope that this will be part of that kind of recovery of a, of a really deep and rich history and making it more widely available. So Jack, tell us a little bit about growing up in Houston and your family background and the things that led you from Cyprus in the Northwest suburbs of Houston to being immersed in these cultures of the Christian East. I'm from Houston, uh, but my mother is from Missouri. She's American, uh, born here. Uh, my father is from Lebanon. He came to America in 1971. My family are Greek Orthodox. So they call an Arabic room, uh, room Orthodox. Um, and I was actually baptized Greek Orthodox uh, as, a, as a baby. But when I was about two, my folks started going to a, a, a Protestant church not far from our house. The Orthodox church was like, like an hour away or 45 minutes away. And so I was raised as a Protestant, non-denominational Protestant in the South. And I actually wanted to study Spanish in, in college. Um, but uh, I ended up studying, studying Arabic sort of through a series of coincidences. I ended up in an Arabic class my first semester. Uh, and because a friend wanted me to take it with him and it fulfilled the degree requirement, I um, took an intro to the Middle East class and I'd wanted to be an American history major and study Spanish. Um, and I, you know, I'd been around Arabic my whole life, but I don't ever really learn like things like cuss words from my father and uh, like things like kifak, like how are you or marhaba, yeah, like, right. hello. And so I took Arabic my first semester and it kicked my butt. It was a really hard language, but it was really beautiful language. It was really amazing. And so I took it again the next semester. At the same time, I took this intro to the Middle East class taught by a woman called Denise Spellberg, who's an amazing teacher uh, at Texas, and she still teaches there. So if you're at UT, take a class of Dr. Spellberg. And it just opened my eyes to a whole world that I had not really known uh, much about, if anything. And so I kept taking classes in the Middle East. And um, over the course of my time at UT, I ended up being an Arab. I had different majors. One of them was I ended up being an Arabic major. And I ended up majoring in Middle Eastern studies. And I learned a ton about the Middle East and I loved it. And at a certain point, I started saying, well, there's this weird disconnect between what I'm studying and my own personal history, because my family are Middle Eastern Christians. I've got family in the Middle East who are, who are Christians, but Middle Eastern history, as it is, you know, I think common, maybe less so today, but I think definitely, you know, 20 plus years ago now, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, whatever, it was taught as being basically being Islamic history. And so I had a really simple question, like, what happened to all the Christians? Where did the Christians go? How does it go from, you know, Jesus walked, he, Jesus from the Middle East and Paul was in the Middle East or first called Christians in Antioch. Well, where did all the Christians go? And how did everybody start speaking Arabic there? I had these sort of questions in my head and I was going to go uh, to law school, uh, but just sort of another long story for the heck of it. I applied for a Marshall scholarship to go to Oxford and I got it. And I said, I, what I wanted to study at Oxford was Eastern Christianity. Uh, and so I went there and I spent two years, two of the best years of my life um, studying at Oxford. I, your teacher, uh, Sebastian Brock, I was uh, with Sebastian Brock. His last year there was my first year there. And then I worked with David Taylor, Sebastian's successor. And this whole world just opened up to me and it was amazing. And I've sort of been on that odyssey ever since. It's been 20 years this fall since I went to Oxford. So anyways, that's sort of the, the short version uh, of, of how I got interested in the Middle East. And so discovering the history of Middle Eastern Christianity it was, it was uh, quite an eye-opening and amazing intellectual experience for me. Not just sort of people often think, oh, Eastern Christianity is Greek Orthodoxy and Russian Orthodoxy, which it is, but also Middle Eastern Christianity, Syriac language Christianity, sort of the Syriac traditions, uh, which are much less known, but which were hugely uh, influential and important uh, for large parts of, of church history. And so discovering that world uh, was a real eye-opener for me. What did your dad think of all this? Like when you came home from UT and said, hey, dad, you know, I'm taking Arabic this semester. Uh, he was, I think he was okay with it. I think my dad, the thing was, my father, 
like many Middle Eastern parents, wanted me to be a medical doctor. Uh, and so I was pre-med for a while, not on paper, but I was telling people I was pre-med. And then I had this realization, I don't want to be pre-med. Um, and then I told him I wanted to be a lawyer and he's, he was okay with a lawyer. Um, yeah. And then I got that Marshall scholarship and um, <laughs> he thought it was a Rhodes scholarship. He didn't know the difference, but he's happy I went to Oxford. Um, and then um, I never forget, I, I applied to come to study to do a PhD at Princeton. And I called him on the phone. I said, dad, I'm, I got into Princeton to do a PhD at Princeton in history. I'm going to become an historian. He's like, oh, great. He was so excited for me. Um, and then the next day he called me up. He's like, so what does an historian do? <laughs> <laughs> um and so but um no he loved it i used to call him on the phone and talk to him and uh in arabic i'd ask him questions about arabic uh we're studying and um they you know they teach you in i don't know how they do it now in, in many places but they back in texas back in the day they taught you fusha, like classical standard arabic mm -hmm. standard arabic and i would call him and talk to him on the phone on standard arabic which looking back it probably sounded very stilted to him because it's like when you went to lebanon i talked to, talk to them in standard arabic there they're like he's not like a mexican i was like what do you mean like a mexican they said well all the mexican soap operas here are dubbed into fusha and so you sound like a, <laughs> they, they, they mexican speak. And i was like, okay anyways but i think he loved it i think he really loved it i call him up and i talk to him on the phone and of course um, so my dad is from Lebanon, but his parents are from Yaffa and what was then Palestine. Oh, right. And um, one of my uh, teachers at Texas, a guy called Peter Aboud, who's an amazing, amazing man. Um, he'd actually known the Tanus family in Yaffa. He, he used to remember walking by their house. And so it was this amazing small world connection to meet Dr. Aboud. And ha he's one of my teachers, had a huge influence on me. And that made my dad really happy that Dr. Aboud was like from Yaffa. And he had sort of knew where the Tanus house was in Yaffa back in the day. Um, and so he was really happy about it. Now, I never became a doctor, never became a lawyer. My brother became a lawyer. But I think as long as I can pay the bills, he's happy. Uh, and so I'm you paying the bills by the grace of God. I mean, you did get a PhD, so you became a doctor. But as people keep telling us, not a real doctor. Not a real doctor. <laughs> I, I'm not a physician. <laughs> I love that story because so often when immigrants come to the U.S., they they shed so much. I mean, you know, ends up going to a you know Protestant church in Houston, Texas, doing the whole American thing you know, launches you off to University of Texas to go off and do pre-med and so on. And, and then you reconnect. And that, that, that must be maybe surprising and also very moving that that, that, that kind of circle starts to get closed again. I think a break. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's, I think it's, it's maybe in some ways atypical. I think America is amazing. Okay. America is also like this thing just gobbles people up and you sort of assimilate. You know, we went, used to go to um, actually an Arabic Baptist church sometimes on Sunday afternoons when I was in high school, because long story, but the, the pastor of that church knew my uncle, who became a Baptist in Lebanon, knew, knew him. Um, and the big problem was there are many, you know, Arabic speaking Arab Christians, uh, Protestants uh, in Houston, but they didn't want to go to an Arabic, an Arabic church. They, people just wanted to assimilate and go to an, you know, an American right. church and go to an Arabic church. So, I mean, American people assimilate, it's the melting pot. Uh, and that definitely right. happens a lot, uh, I think in Middle Eastern communities, Middle Eastern Christian communities. So Jack, you were just telling us a little bit about the experience of Arabic speaking Christians in Houston in a, in a Baptist church. Could you say a little bit for our viewers about the different traditions that you might find Arabic speaking Christians uh, belonging to or, or coming from? Because I tried to make a list in preparation for this conversation, and it, it, there are just so many different ones. It's and I think just that that just that fact will sort of blow people's minds, and then we can delve a little bit into the history. Sure. Well, I mean, what you'll find today, I mean, there are Protestants, and there are different kinds of Protestants. Like there, we said, they mentioned there are Baptists, there are Presbyterians. Um, I'm sure there are Episcopalians. Um, uh, there are all kinds of different Catholics. There are. Um, they call Latin, they're Latin, sort of just, you know, they have Latin, right, Roman, Roman Catholics, which you would consider to be Roman Catholic. Then there will be Melkites, who are basically the sister or twin or what do you want to call it of the Greek Orthodox Church. They're called Greek Catholics also. There are Syrian Catholics. Uh, there are um, Chaldean Catholics. Uh, there are Syrian Orthodox, some of whom speak Arabic, some of whom speak, will speak Kurdish or Turkish or other languages uh, or Aramaic. Um, there are Assyrian Orthodox, uh, again, who might speak Persian or, 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 or Kurdish, or, 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 but they also might speak Arabic. Um, there are Coptic Orthodox uh, in Egypt who will speak Arabic. Uh, there are also Coptic Catholic. 
And then you'll find in places like North Africa, I mean, uh, and maybe even in Egypt and other places too, but I think definitely places like Algeria, um, there are Christians there who are from Muslim backgrounds, people who've converted to Christianity who, who are Arabic speaking. And that, those are very, very small communities. But uh, the sort of the historic ancient uh, Arabic speaking Christian communities or medieval or whatever you want to call them um, in the Middle East, they're basically any kind of Orthodox or Protestant, uh, and also there's Maronites in Lebanon, obviously, and Le Maronites in Syria, and Mar Maronites even in Israel. Um, any kind of Catholic you've ever heard of, and probably some of you haven't, will be Arabic speaking, chances are, um, and uh, Orthodox and Protestant. So there's, there's a lot. Uh, so there's a so lot. in every case, all of these traditions that you've listed, except for the Protestant, um, come from very early Christian ancient communities, which had their own distinctive language which they often still use liturgically and so on, but they function in Arabic. So mm. could you say just a little bit about like how that happened? Why didn't people keep speaking Coptic or speaking Syriac or whatever else? There's one of these debates in scholarship. Was there a pre-Islamic Arabic translation of the Bible? Um, and I think that actually there probably was at least parts of the Bible translated into Arabic to use liturgically before the rise of Islam. And it's even been argued by uh, Christian Robin at the CNRS uh, in France by the world's leading um, expert in uh, pre-Islamic Arabia. He argues that, he's argued, uh, he's told me, he thinks that the um, Arabic alphabet may have been invented by Christian missionaries. Something like 90% of all pre-Islamic Arabic inscriptions are, are Christian inscriptions. And the oldest dated pre-Islamic Arabic inscription, the oldest dated Arabic inscription in the world is from 470 from what's today's Southern Saudi Arabia. It's a Christian inscription. So there were Arabic speaking Christians uh, before the rise of Islam. So that's sort of like one group to keep in mind. But then there are the sort of non-Arabic speaking Christian populations in the Middle East before the rise of Islam, Coptic speaking, Greek speaking, Syriac speaking. And they eventually adopt as their sort of everyday language, Arabic. And now why do they do that? I mean, it's a long, slow process and it takes centuries. I was in a talk yesterday and some, someone was uh, mentioning that the earliest dated uh, Christian Arabic uh, uh, text is 772 AD. So 772, but it's almost certain that there were texts written in Arabic by Christians from before that date. We had a brilliant uh, student here uh, at Princeton named Cecilia Palumbo. Um, who did a great dissertation a few years back in, in which she showed that uh, Christian monasteries were collecting taxes uh, for the Muslim state from a very er early point after the Islamic conquest of, this, of the mid seventh century. And so you have Christians serving as scribes uh, in the service of the Muslim state, they're writing in Arabic. And so from an early date, these, these populations, Coptic speaking or Greek speaking or, or Aramaic speaking or whatever, they're using uh, Arabic uh, uh, as part of their sort of day-to-day -day life uh, as they interact with the state, and it becomes a language of, cult, of, of commerce, and eventually a language of culture for these, for these communities. And so different communities sort of start writing in Arabic theologically at, at a different, you know, <laughs> different moment in time. Um, but over the course of the Middle Ages, uh, basically everybody's, by the, you know, by the 10th, 11th, 12th century, all the group, different groups are writing, in, are writing in Arabic in addition to, say, Coptic or Syriac. And eventually Arabic uh, eclipses uh, these sort of languages of Christian late antiquity and becomes like the new Greek. So Greek was a language that people, you could be from Egypt, Columba, and you could be a Coptic speaker, but you're going to write your theological treatise in Greek, sure. say in the sixth century. You could be from Syria and you could be a Syriac speaker, but you're going write, to write your treatise in Greek. Arabic becomes that way. Um, it becomes sort of a new lingua franca for theological discussion and discourse and for worship. Um, again, over the course of the centuries after uh, the Islamic conquest. That's really interesting because it's sort of a two-sided coin. On the one hand, they lose some of their distinctive culture because their traditional language sort of withdraws into monasteries and, and liturgies. On the other hand, all of these different Christian traditions can speak to each other now because they do have a lingua franca and Arabic becomes a very sophisticated theological language. I mean, people don't realize this. People think of, again, there's a, a quote, I forget what, maybe the 19th, from some figure in the 19th century, maybe he's maybe a Muslim even said this, Al -Arabiya lam nasar, Arabic never became Christian, right? And so this is the idea that Arabic is an Islamic language, um, but there is a vast literature, Christian, vast Christian literature in Arabic. Um, and I, I never forget, I was, 
and I went to Egypt in like 2001 or something. I can't remember when it was. And I remember I went to a uh, Dubar, the very famous Protestant church there uh, uh, behind uh, Midan Tahrir. And I bought a, a, a book of theology, some Protestant theology book in Arabic. And it had this intro, and maybe written by like a 19th century Presbyterian or something. He said, we hope that at one point, Arabic uh, Arab Christians will develop their own theology. But at this point, it's all dependent on the West. And I was like, this is such, oh, wow. such an ignorant statement yeah, yeah. Uh, because people were writing theology, Christian theology in Arabic before they were writing it in English. <laughs> they're, you know, they're writing Christian theology before they're writing in German, before English even, like when Beowulf was being written, there's stuff being written in Arabic by Christians. I think there's a huge ignorance about the, the depth and the breadth and the richness of Christian theological expression in Arabic. I think maybe in the Middle East, but definitely in the West as well. I mean, there's a, a text called the Apocalypse of Pseudo um, Samuel of Kalamu. It's a mouthful, but it's a, a text written uh, in Coptic. It purports to be written in the 7th century, probably written actually in the 10th century. Um, it survives only in Arabic, but it, one of the things it decries is it decries the loss of Coptic. It says people are no longer writing in Coptic. They're writing in Arabic. They're no longer giving their, their children the names of saints. And angels are giving their children the names of, of the people of the Hijra, the children of the Hijra, oh. i.e. Muslim names. And it says that they make fun of people from the South, i.e. Saidi. So, you know, in Egypt, they'll make fun of people from the Saidi. It's what's going on in the 10th century. But you can see in this text, Arabization happening right before your eyes in this text. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, so it's people made choices. Like, why do people stop speaking Gaelic and start speaking English in Ireland or whatever? It's a similar kind of question. Like, why do people adopt the language of uh, of a you know of the the rulers right uh, and it happens for economic for social reasons you want to get a job you got to speak good Arabic maybe if you're doing commerce and you do international commerce you got to speak Arabic Arabic's a language of science it's a language of culture a language of debate so for all these reasons people people gradually start adopting Arabic could you say a little bit for our our viewers because they may not know this story of the significant role that Christian intellectuals played in Arabic translation. Many people have heard, if they know one thing about the medieval Middle East, they'll, they'll have heard that a lot of Greek stuff was translated into Arabic in Baghdad, right? Uh, a French scholar once sort of sat down and tried to look at all the different translators from whom we had names. And I think he came up with like something like 61 different names of translators. Of those 61, I think 59 were Christians. The translation movement of Baghdad in the ninth and say 10th centuries where a huge number uh, of Greek texts, philosophical, scientific, and otherwise were translated from Greek into Arabic, often from Greek into Syriac and Syriac into Arabic. The people doing the translating were, were almost all Christians. Um, and that's sort of part of a larger story of, uh, of translation from Greek into Syriac, Greek into Armenian, Greek into Coptic, uh, whatever, uh, that's going on uh, throughout late antiquity, especially in a Syriac uh, context where a huge number of Greek works are translated into Syriac going back to say second century, let's say. The, the translation movement of Baghdad is the best known, but uh, there are scholars now who are working on uh, another translation movement uh, that happens around Antioch, between Antioch down to St. Catharines, where a huge number of Christian texts are translated uh, from Greek and Syriac into Arabic. So there's a, a lesser known uh, Greco-Arabic translation movement um, that happens at roughly the same time, maybe a little bit later than the Baghdad one. Uh, again, a, a massive transference of, of texts from Greek, often written in late antiquity, into Arabic. And it's part of the way Arabic becomes a, a language in which high level Christian theological discussion can happen and also worship can happen. And as we know from the medieval history in the West, that's how we recovered so much of that Greek stuff was through the Arabic translations. So, uh, you know, Aquinas, for example, I mean, access to Aristotle, how did Aristotle come back to the West? Well, it came through the Arabic stuff. Uh, so it's, it's a great story. So I, I want to talk a little bit about passion. Now oh, you're a man of passion, Jack. <laughs> I've never had a conversation with you about anything, whether it's academic or you know sports or world events or political things and so on, where you don't show your passion. Now, obviously, you're excited about the fact that when we talk about Arabic speaking Christians and Christian Arabic literature, it's a kind of undertold or even untold story. And I know you love to bring this stuff out and to share it with people who may have never have heard any of this stuff. But can you probe a little deeper about what, what it is that really excites you about this and keeps you going deeper and makes you get up every day and read this stuff and then go out and teach it to your students and talk about it at conferences and all of that? So one is a sense of discovery. Uh, a friend of mine is a uh, 
the librarian here for Greek and other things, classics and other things. He says, listen, Byzantine Greek, what's exciting about Byzantine Greek is it's not just the chance to reinterpret, right? You know, you could be the 50th person to write a dissertation on Aristophanes or whatever. It's a chance for discovery, right? And it's the same thing in Christian Arabic, same thing in Syriac, same thing in almost any Eastern Christian language. There is so much work to be done. And, and that's at, from a level of a scholar, it's amazing to have this, this fundamental work. It's like, if, it's like as if you were alive in the 17th or 18th century and you're editing patristic texts and reading some late antique author who's well known now for the first time in the West or whatever, right? It's, it's, a, it's a similar sense of possibility and discovery. That's maybe a nerdy answer. Um, another answer is, as a person who was raised basically in a Western Christian tradition, um, uh, to study the East is to like encounter Christianity, which is like, it's like meeting a first cousin who's very similar to you, but also like a little bit different in, in a really cool way. And you sort of understand, okay, I understand why mom always does that because my uncle does that too. And they're all from the same family and sort of like, you sort of see yourself and your own formation in a different way. It's a really cool sense of discovery and a different kind of discovery. So I, I love that. Three, this is going to sound maybe jargony, but studying Eastern Christianity is provincializing in a really wonderful way. Um, let me unpack that for you. Um, I think that the, for many people, um, Christianity is synonymous with Western Christianity. People don't realize, I think Philip Jenkins in his book, Lost Christianities, whatever that book is called, he has a footnote in there somewhere. And I can't remember what, he, what his source for this was. And again, pre-modern demographics are always a crapshoot, but I'll just put that and I'll cite it anyways. He says in the year 1000, there were maybe, I think, um, 25 million Christians in Europe, uh, 5 million Christians in Africa, and 17 million Christians in Asia. I think those numbers are very surprising. And again, he could, they could be wrong. And maybe I may have mis even misquoted him there. But mm -hmm. just the sense that the global scope of the Christian experience in the Middle Ages and in in late antiquity, for that matter, is it, for me, it's endlessly fascinating. And it's sort of, again, it's like that first cousin experience. And when you hear, I was recently at a dinner talking to some people who are experts in China, and I was like, yeah, there were Christians in China by the year 635. And the Mongolian alphabet uh, is maybe based on the Syriac alphabet, either because of Manichaean or because of Christian missionaries. They had, these are great scholars. They'd never heard these things. Um, and to discover there have been Christians in South India since, say, at least the, mm -hmm. at least the third century, if not even earlier. It could be definitely even it could be definitely be earlier, but we have evidence from at least the third century, and the tradition holds that goes back to the first century. That's before there are Christians in Great Britain. That's before right. there are Christians in Sweden. And so just to have sort of your assumptions sort of challenged and undermined that way, and for me, it's a really wonderful experience. There's a whole field I've discovered recently called world Christianity. And those are those who are watching, if anybody watches this and it's like, oh, you you discovered world Christianity. It's just I'm a, I'm a pre-modern, it's a modern field. Um, and you hear things like there are more Christians in church on Sunday in China than there are Christians in church on Sunday in Europe. Those kind of statistics blow your mind. Mm -hmm. Are there more, you know, Presbyterians in, I think maybe Ghana, practicing Presbyterians in Ghana than there are in Scotland? It's sort of these things really revolutionize right. or that, you know, the majority of Christians in this world live in the global south in Latin America or in Africa or these things are, to me, it really, again, it re relativizes my own experience, my own perspective, I think in really healthy and good ways. Mm -hmm. and so that's one of the reasons I, I think I love uh, studying the Christian East. Theological expression is different when you read someone like Ephraim, Ian, Robert Murray. Did you know Robert Murray? I did. He was one of yeah. my examiners for my doctoral dissertation. So a great Jesuit, Robert Murray. I, I, I met him once. I sat at a dinner once between him and Peter Brown. He was from a, his family, I think, were congregationalist missionaries in, in China. And he was delivered, uh, I get this, always get this messed up. The doctor who delivered him, I think, removed the last Chinese emperor's tonsils and delivered Chiang Kai-shek or vice versa. <laughs> and, and, he, and he told me, he said, if you can't put your theology in poetry, I'm not interested. Some of the greatest theologians are poets. And to go and read Syriac poetry uh, and the beauty of go and read Ephraim's Hymns on Paradise, just that whole way of viewing the world. Go read Sebastian Brock's Luminous Eye. It's amazing. Again, it's like meeting a first cousin and sort of like, it's just in this really, really amazing, beautiful way. And to have those experiences was for me like really formative and transformative. And I like to share that with other people. I'd have to say the same has been true for me. Um, I think my study of the Christian East began really with an interest in liturgy. 
since I was sort of headed toward liturgical studies at one point. And then later, as I switched more into monastic studies and asceticism, you know, the realization that the rule of Benedict is toward the end of a process of development and that the roots are all in the Christian East. Yeah. And then, you know, with Hemel, the, the real journey began for me, uh, getting to know these, these different churches and traditions in a very personal way and on the ground. Could you say a little bit, Jack, about how you see the situation of these Arabic speaking Christian communities in the Middle East today and what we need to be aware of and um, how, dare I suggest, the work of Himmel might help in that process? Well, I think that um, it's not good. <laughs> I think it's a pretty bad situation. Depends on where you are, but I think it's not really good anywhere. You know, we, you mentioned Aleppo. We went to Aleppo in 2008 and it was amazing. You know, they talk about, you know, Levantine cities. There's maybe two Levantine cities left. There's like Aleppo and Beirut, places where you could see this like Ottoman era mixture of different religious communities and the amazing diversity. I read somewhere, and I could be wrong about this, that Aleppo had undergone like the most destruction or bombing of any city in the world since the Second World War or some horrible statistic. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm probably misstating that, but just to see a beautiful city destroyed and the an ancient uh, community, a set of communities, whole and kind of a coexistence and all these things vanished. It's absolutely terrible. In Iraq, over the past 20 or so years, the population of Christians there has decreased by hundreds of thousands. You can probably give me the exact number, but like maybe even a million. I don't know. It's been really a catastrophic. So Syria, Iraq have had catastrophic uh, decreases in their populations. I mean, the State Department declared what happened in Syria and maybe Iraq also um, at the hands of Daesh, uh, ISIS, to be a genocide. Look at Lebanon right now. I have a bunch of family in Lebanon. Lebanon is in terrible shape economically. They don't have electricity. They don't have their, the Lebanese pound is terrible. horrible inflation. So Lebanon's in terrible shape. Egypt is you know, Egypt's hanging in there, I think. And again, I'm not a political scientist. I study sort of Syriac and Arabic stuff from a different millennium. But it's Egypt's a tough place too, just not just for Christians, but Christians and Muslims. There was a time in the last decade where you'd get regular reports, often not mentioned in, in the Western media, of sort of attacks on Christians that are at, happening at the hands of militants. And so there's a real sense of, of precarity, even in Egypt. I mean, numerically, Egypt still has by far the, the most robust Christian population in the whole Middle East. I don't know. No, no one really knows the population of Christians in Egypt is. It's always for political reasons. People don't talk about it. Maybe 10 million people. Who knows? Several million anyway. Yeah, yeah there's in the millions. And maybe there's probably more Christians in Egypt than there are in all the rest of the Middle East combined. It's not good. I mean, there was a, there was a time, I think, in the earlier 2000s when things were in a better place for Middle Eastern Christians, like, you know, William Dalrymple's book right. from the Holy Mountain. It's pretty grim in that book. And I remember when I went to Oxford, Dr. Brock says, well, things have seemed to have gotten better than they were in Dalrymple. So there was sort of a, a moment, a parentheses, and then uh, things, have, things have gotten worse. And people, Christian or Muslim, who can immigrate are immigrating. When you've got failed states and violence and inflation. And so the heartland of these communities, um, is not in good shape. You know, it's interesting you talk about that that period where things seem to be getting better. Um, so I believe in providence. I'm, you know, I believe that that there is a plan, right? And I look back at you know Himmel going into Lebanon in 2003, Syria 2004, Iraq 2009, and I'm thinking, you know, if you had known the future and tried to plan when to go in and do this work, that would have been precisely the time to go in and do it. Yeah, actually, I, I didn't finish the second part of your question, but yeah, exactly. So when I met you in 2008 at, in Aleppo, I was like, man, this guy is doing amazing work. But I was like, you know, Syria is so stable. It's this really stable sort of, you know, police. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, we had like, you know, secret, secret police watching you like nothing's going to happen here. Right. And so you went in there, Hemel went and in cooperation with all the local communities, you digitize these things and you could give the statistics better than I can, but collections that later on became endangered, you, you digitized. I mean, the most famous thing for me is at that conference in 08, we all, everybody got to see the Chronicle of Michael the Syrian, which is 
one mm-hmm. of the most important, maybe it's the most important for definitely for the Syrian Orthodox Church, one of the most important med- uh, medieval chronicles for any church in the Middle Ages, a, chron- a historical chronicle, a massive important tome for people who were interested in the Crusades, people interested in the rise of Islam, all kinds of things. It was held in, the, in a safe in a church in Hagia Sorian, the Syrian Orthodox neighborhood in Aleppo. And at the conference, they brought it out. Like there's two people. I remember that. Made, yeah, they, and they brought it out. We get to see it. We're like, wow, it was amazing. It's like seeing a, a, a rock star, but even cooler. You and Gorgias and George Kiraz and, and the patriarch and, 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 and the bishop had the agreement and, and you digitized it. And now, is the, is the manuscript in Lebanon? I don't know where the manuscript is, but it was sort of my, I got sick in my stomach thinking about things. I mean, obviously, the human loss is orders of magnitude mm-hmm. worse and and much worse than any uh, loss of a manuscript. But, but still, as what, doing what I do, I was I was worried about these things. Absolutely. And I was so happy that you you digitized, that, that Himmel had been working and digitizing these things, which became, again, I don't know, you can tell, you can probably tell us right now what's been lost or what's been moved, but it hasn't been good. So Himmel sort of went through before and, and sort of preserved unknowingly <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, not knowing what the future was going to hold, a lot of really important stuff. Yeah, we thought we were going in sort of after bad things had happened to stabilize yeah. it and then and then look what happened. Jack, I want to turn the conversation again in a slightly more personal way. Sure. Um, so before I ask you our, our big questions for the interview, you've taken your passion for Middle Eastern Christianity in a, a very personal direction by actually marrying one. <laughs> Could, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, Jeanette and where, how she fits in this whole picture and so on? So I, I, I have, uh, I was introduced to my wife by friends because I'm from this very weird, very small demographic, sort of half and half, half Middle Eastern, half. My mom is American of European descent, um, uh, kind of Protestant, Protestant-ish, whatever. And they introduced me to a, uh, my wife, who is also half and half. Her mother's German and uh, her dad is Egyptian. So my, my wife is um, born in Germany, grew up in Cairo. She used to work for the EU and used to work for the German government um, in sort of women's economic development. She's from Cairo and she grew up in Cairo. I was always like a, you know, it's about Syria and Lebanon, but now we go to the Middle East, we go to, we go to Egypt. And so I've become, I'm not an, you know, I'm claim to expertise in anything, but when we go to the Middle East, we go to Egypt and I've become a big fan of Egypt as a result of the visits there and, you know, spending time with her family. And um, so, yeah, so it gave me a, a perspective on part of the Middle East I didn't know so much about. Um, but yeah, so she's, she's from, I mean, her father is baptized Coptic, but he was raised Protestant. His, his, his dad wasn't religious and his mother was a Protestant. So He's sort of, in some ways, kind of like me, you know, baptized Orthodox, but raised Protestant. Um, but anyway, she's great. Um, he is great. Uh, yeah. I know. Um, you know, I think a lot of us, Jack, who knew you thought, you know, who on earth is Jack going to marry? <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you, you had friends who, who knew the right woman. And, uh, yeah. No, well, I mean. Know, I, you all thought it was perfect from the start. <laughs> It was a match. It was a match. I had met my Luke Yarbrough actually teaches at UCLA. He and his wife are the ones who set us up because he had I known him for probably five years uh, when he introduced me to my wife. And he uh, Luke had known Luke and his wife, Aubrey, had known my wife for probably seven years. They knew her from Cairo. Aubrey and my wife used to work together in Cairo. And so we were introduced by mutual friends. I said, yeah, why don't we introduce them? This is kind of from similar backgrounds. Um, half a world apart. I think that fully closes the circle, Jack, if you actually yeah. marry into it. Um, <laughs> and I wish we had time to talk about her work because she's done, you know, amazing things over the years in Sinai and places like that. So maybe we'll get her on sometime. You should get her. You should get her on. She's much more interesting and a much better per- human being than I am too. So she's definitely my my better half. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, then that helps all of us. So, so Jack, at this point, I want to turn to... Um, two important questions that we ask every one of our guests. And the first one is, we've talked about the tough situation of Middle Eastern Christians. Uh, You know, their long history of sort of cultural erosion, then more recently, uh, the challenges of war and and migration and immigration and so on. So when you look at all that stuff, and you look at that long history, much of it tragic, where do you find hope? So, I mean, you mentioned Providence, and I have to say, I have to go religious on you. I am a believing Christian. I have to say that um, I think there's a mystery of Providence at work in this world, and I think it'll all work itself out somehow. Um, and I think that um, 
migration has led to a lot of changes, but it's also led to a lot of opportunities. I think that, um, you know, I once uh, went to a lunchtime talk here um, in Arabic when I was a graduate student given by like, Al Jazeera's American correspondent. Um, and he talked about um, how the goal of Al Jazeera was to, to, was to look at the news with Ayn Arabiya, an Arabic eye. And I asked him after the talk in the q and I said, is there a difference between Ayn Arabiya, an Arabic eye, and Ayn Islamiya, and a Muslim eye? And he said, and I said, do, you, can, do people conflate being Arab with being Muslim? And I know many Middle Eastern Christian groups would say we're Arabic speaking, but we aren't Arabs. But my family is Greek Orthodox. We don't have a problem with that. Anyways, um, and he said, actually, that this it was a debate. This is years ago. This, this was a debate within Al Jazeera itself. Mm -hmm. And they'd received a lot of criticism from Arabic speaking Christians in America on precisely this topic. And so I think that like immigration and migration have changed things. Um, but I think the world's connected. And I think that in the diaspora, uh, there's a lot of energy and interest in, in some quarters, and I hope it grows in the future, mm -hmm. in cultural preservation. Um, I had a student this past semester who, for his paper for my class, he wrote like an ethnography of his Coptic church in North Jersey. It was great. And it was great as a piece of work, but it was also great because uh, I learned a lot about the Coptic church. In North Jersey. It was a very dynamic church in North I had not realized how, quite how uh, flourishing it is there. And so uh, in the diaspora, these communities are holding on to their traditions, are trying to. People send money back home, although now you can't really send money to Lebanon. It's super expensive and difficult. I don't know. I think that, that the Eastern Christian traditions, it was it Pope John Paul II said the Eastern rites are the, the jewel of the, of, the, of the Catholic Church. There's a sense in which these traditions are their treasures for all Christians, no matter what their sort of denomination is. And... I hope that people in sort of non-Middle Eastern Christian traditions will see that value and, and try to pr help preserve the texts and, and, the, and the tradition and the culture. Middle Eastern Christianity will survive, but maybe in forms we don't quite understand right now. And those traditions won't be lost. And again, I think there's a mystery of providence at work. That's really um, interesting. Yeah. I mean, just the fact that your father emigrated, if he hadn't, I wouldn't be talking to you now. Yeah. And we wouldn't have you as an advocate of these traditions. Yeah. You'd, I don't know, you'd have a, you'd be a lawyer in Beirut or, you know, you'd have a store or a car dealership or, or who knows what. Um, that'd be a pretty tough life right now, in fact. So, so Jack, the last question I want to ask you before I, I thank you is, why does cultural preservation matter? I think cultural preservation matters because, first off, these things are important for their own sake, but also, and I'm going to violate Kant's categorical comparative here, but they're also viable as a means to an end, as our own end. And if and people talk about the loss of ecological diversity, when you know the people cut rainforests down, you lose all these different animals that we could learn about from. If you lose these sort of exp cultural expressions from the past, there's a great deal we can learn from them. To go back to my own sort of personal experience, the, the experience of meeting a first cousin that you'd never known before and understanding yourself better. From a Christian perspective, to study a Christian tradition that's different from your own in an open-minded way is tremendously enriching. And it's, I think, enlarging. It may sort of increases your sort of sympathy for humanity. I think even for people who aren't maybe approaching this from a, a religious uh, framework, within a religious framework, again, all of these sort of human cultural expressions are valuable uh, because they show different ways that you can be human, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's a question of different ways that, of being Christian, also just different ways of being a human, full stop, and different ways of thinking about the world, where the world comes from, where the world's going, what, what is the good, what does a good life look like? These are questions that people didn't start asking, asking about sort of on the left bank in Paris in the 1960s with John Paul Sartre or whatever, right? They've been asking these questions and answering these questions in different ways for as long as people have been around. And if you sort of lose some of the answers that have been given, you lose part of yourself. And you lose opportunities to learn more about yourself and what it means to be human. And I think that the work you guys are doing, um, I think St. Bennett would be really proud uh, of, of what Himmel's doing. I mean, you're in a tradition that goes back 1400 years. And if you were alive as a Benedictine in the 17th century, you'd be editing texts. And if you were alive as a Benedictine in the year 1000, you'd be copying texts. If you're alive as a Benedictine today in the 21st century, you're digitizing them and you're preserving them. And, you, and Himmel is sort of like a modern vivarium. I think St. Ben would be really proud of Himmel. Anyways, that's what I would say. Thank you. Th thank you, Jack. That, that's, that's great. I, 
I mean, I love so many things that you said today and thank you for that little nod to the Benedictine tradition and the work of Hemel. But I love your first cousin analogy because if I can speak of my own experience, spending time in Eastern Christian communities, going to many Eastern Christian liturgies has changed the way I experience worship in my own Latin rite. So this kind of, you know, very sober, you know, highly dignified Western approach to liturgy complemented by those other traditions, it, it has completely transformed yeah. how I view what I do every single day as, as a Benedictine monk. But the other thing I take away is your emphasis on discovery and the fact that we, we have through our work digitized these thousands of manuscripts which contain the voices of the past, voices we, we don't have otherwise because we don't have you know, YouTube or TikTok or any, anything else that has preserved their voices for us. It's just the stuff they wrote down, right? Which would have been the, the things that were most important to them. I think the promise of discovery is one that excites me about what we do because it's gonna keep people like you and you know, doctoral students and everybody else busy for a very long time. Long time. What did James Joyce say when he wrote Ulysses? This will keep the professors busy for a long time. You know, you're going to keep professors doing for a right. long time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, there's many lifetimes of work to be done on all the stuff Himmel's, Himmel's digitized. It's amazing. Well, th thank you, Jack. It's been great talking to you. Likewise. It's always a pleasure, Columba. And I want to encourage our viewers to share the program with others uh, via the posting on the YouTube channel. And I'd also encourage you to provide feedback via the online survey that we'll be sending after the program premiere. And we'll be coming back to you soon with news about our next episode. I know who I'm going to interview, but I actually have to ask her first. So stay tuned for more details about that. Jack Tanus, great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.